Hello. Hello, how are you? Hello. Hi. <laughs> and Susan and Abacheck. My camera is very well. Hello. Don't know why it's fuzzy. Oh, I don't know. I can just turn it off too, but because oh. <laughs> it's just yeah. not working right. Oh. Well, this yeah, the sun. I guess I don't know. If... Yeah, there's a window over here, but and oh, that's it to bother it. Oh. Um, but... I don't know. <laughs> Well, there's a window behind and a window over there. And, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, welcome to the meeting, everyone. Uh, so far, it probably be people coming in the next few minutes. So, um, this week, uh, is any, does anyone have anything they'd like to present this week? I know not everyone's here, but I know a couple people said they might want to present something. Hi, Bradley. Hi. Uh, hi, Susan. Um, actually, I don't have anything to present right now because I just started with my GUI work, which I promised. Uh, so I, I, I figured out a way to, you know, uh, have a React frontend with Docker capability, like uh, have it in a Docker container, so that it uh, supports the cross-platform builds as well. So um, yeah, I, I'm like right now work, uh, like designing a UI, which I, I have mentioned in my proposal, like some mockups, but I, I, I'm thinking of, you know, making it more interactive and maybe uh, maybe more uh, better for like how like the loading images and all that, realizing it takes a bit of time. So I, I'm just uh, like, you know, playing around with the front end right now. Uh, yeah, so I just initialized the work. I actually wanted to ask Bradley if I could move those work to the demo worm GitHub repository, or should I just keep it with my own and just uh, share you or include you as a contributor or something? Uh, yeah, if you want to uh, issue a, a pull request, that would be great. What what um, what project does it fit into most closely? Smarter on the telephones. No. I'm sorry. What what project does it uh, fit into most closely? I'm trying to figure out what repo you could push it to. Uh, well, it, it was this like the accelerator embryo thing. So I have to. I, I'm actually making the front end like the GUI I promised in my proposal. So I thought why not start the work right now because I'm having lots of time right now. And my uh, university exams would be coming up later, so I would get really busy. So I thought, why not finish some work, which uh, I could do possibly by now. So I, I was making, I started making the front end part using the React framework. And I tried adding the Docker container support also. It's just initialized, initialized work. Uh, maybe if I get into some stages later on, like right now loading images is done. And if I if I uh, get into the distortion part, labeling and notation part, uh, I promise later I I will be keeping it like uh, I'll be pushing the work to my own repo. Uh, but later on uh, we can move it like if, if there's an initial release or something, we can maybe move it to demo and yeah. repo. Yeah, I think that would be great. I I don't know where to put it right now. I'd have to. Kind of figure yeah, that's, out that's a, fine. yeah. That's that's totally fine. I I'll be sharing a live demo like hopefully by the next week. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. That sounds great. Thank you for the update. Right, yeah. yeah. Um. We've got hello, Mynak and Yash and Krishna and Tarun. How are you? Great. How are you? Okay. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Um, so does Susan any, is what was that? I'm saying that Susan is signing. Oh yeah. <laughs> I guess uh, she's sitting in front of, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. I guess. <laughs> so does any, anyone have anything to present? I know some people came in since I asked before. So I'll present. 
Okay. I'm just going to turn off my camera. It's you. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. Can you see my screen? Uh, not yet. Is it visible now? Uh, not yet. Is okay. There we go. There we go. So, hello everyone, uh, I'm going to present, uh, uh, from now onwards I'm going to present uh, four tutorials, kind of tutorials, so I can say that uh, uh, articles kind of stuff, uh, where I'm going to depict how deep learning can be used for uh, life sciences, apart from the, you know, uh, regular commercial use of deep learning, but for other domains that are not uh, specifically computer science. So I, I'll be pushing the code in uh, GitHub very soon. So this first thing is, uh, as you know that diseases are the oldest cause of human suffering. From the dawn of human civilization, humans have been suffering from pathogens, cancers and uh, neurological conditions. So one of the greatest achievement of uh, last few centuries has been the development of effective treatment for many diseases. And the, uh, the problem I'm going to address today uh, is regarding pre uh, is regarding the solubility of a chemical compound and uh, it's very important property for a drug because if a drug is not able to you know so, uh, is not soluble enough it won't be able uh, to get mixed in the bloodstream of a patient and will not have its effects. So uh, I, I was using a uh, deep chem it's in library that uh, usually do uh, does most of the heavy working task for uh, special uh, leak, uh, chemistry based task so the first thing that we need is a data that measures the solubility for real molecules one of the core component of deep chem is molecular net it's a diverse collection of chemical and molecular data sets so we use then the soluble data so this is uh, uh, this is in uh, you can see a screenshot of the data you can see that uh, here we have a compound name we have ESOL prediction, that's, uh, you know, uh, how uh, how the solubility is. Then we have molecular weight, we ha uh, have uh, polarity of the surface, and many other, uh, other things. So, uh, one doesn't, you know, uh, really needs to have very good grasp of uh, chemistry for working on these data sets. Because most of the thing that uh, we are interested in, we are interested in, you know, uh, getting an X and predicting and Y. Having a domain specific knowledge is, you know, good, but not very uh, explicit. So, and these are the, uh, okay. So, one more thing that uh, for images, we use uh, convolution neural networks. But uh, since uh, this data set is not explicitly uh, image based, or uh, it's not exactly tabular also, because uh, all the molecules kind of form a graph-like structure. So, uh, uh, we will be using uh, graph convolution networks. Uh, so, uh, like uh, for, a uh, for an image, we have different uh, pixel values, uh, and splitting them, we can, you know, uh, get all the convolution functions in it that are max pooling, average pooling, pooling, and there can be also uh, different layers, like fully connected layers and all, but in a graph convolution uh, network. To get a hidden representation of a node, for example, let us control a red node here. One simple solution of glass convolution operation takes the average value of the node features of a particular node along with its neighbor. And that is uh, different from image data. The neighbor of the node are unordered and variable in size. But in case of a regular 2D, uh, in a regular image, uh, that's not the case. Because they are ordered. You can see that uh, when we have the 2D convolution. There are, uh, you know, uh, they can be represented in case of a definite matrix and all of them have a uh, different uh, gap between them. Okay, so this is how a CNN works. Uh, most probably everyone of you would be knowing its uh, usage, so I'll not explain that. Uh, and for graph convolution network, uh, our image can be somehow, uh, its dimension can be increased. Uh, it's not, you know, making it into 3D. But it's a way of kindly uh, 
visualizing it. So uh, we have all this, uh, you can say all this chemical compounds can be treated as a node. Then we have a, a node value for a particular molecule. So the, uh, after uh, using the predefined uh, uh, data, uh, after using the predefined uh, uh, graph convolution network, the results I got without much of, I can say, uh, tweaking into the network on uh, four epochs was a, a root mean square uh, value of 1.7. And since you can see that there is difference between training set and test set, and this usually happens in mostly all of the deep uh, neural networks, and it happens because uh, the test data is uh, usually not uh, is not shown to the model, so it performs a little bit less accurate because of the unshown test data. And this is the formula of uh, root mean square deviation. So these are the references. I highly encourage uh, everyone to you know go through them. That deep deep chem library is really wonderful. And most of the things are uh, predefined in it. So a person who is uh, you can say a chemistry person who doesn't have much of uh, programming knowledge can e e easily do stuff on it without much of his uh, time being wasted in learning programming. And uh, these are the two papers that were really helpful. So these are also available online. So that's it. Any questions? Uh, <clears throat> well, actually, why don't you bring your slides back up? <laughs> um, yeah, any questions? Uh... Because I have a few. So, I, I, okay, so if you can go back to maybe, let's see, where do you introduce uh, graph convolution? Like five? Yeah. Okay, seven. Okay, uh, so this, so the difference between graph convolution and like say convolution in a regular neural network is what? You're taking like uh, a structured graph yes and you're doing this a similar thing to what you would do in convolution in 2d yes yes like for a, uh, convolu a normal convolution network all of these uh, are you know uh, somehow equally distant there's an there is an order for example if i want to uh, do max pooling here all i have to do is find the neighbors and every neighbor would be uh, somehow equal but that's not the case for a uh, graph convolution because there isn't uh, an ordered uh, thing going on here. So, uh, for example, if I have to come uh, in a layman term, if uh, I have to do some operation of uh, this pixel, for example, or this uh, node, uh, so uh, there are chances that the closest one would be most uh, probably affecting it. But I have a neighbor that is very distant, so the uh, the effect it would be having on that uh, particular thing would be a significantly less. So the order is lacking here and uh, uh, the uh, weighted average of every pixel or everything uh, here is somehow stable but uh, not in the case for graph calculation. Okay. Uh, could you go to the, I think the next slide. Yeah. Uh, Alright, so now in the bottom you have an example of a molecule and then you have a graph so is that graph being calculated as sort of a representation of that molecule? Like, is it a spatial yeah. representation, or is it what 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 does it describe? Uh, can you uh, please uh, repeat the question? Okay, so the molecule is here on the left, and then the next thing there is a four-node network. So, yeah. what does that represent about the molecule? Uh, it's kind of an, uh, you can say, digital manifestation of the network, of the molecule here, and it's uh, being represented into a uh, graph. Uh, we are just modeling it in a digital way. So, uh, like uh, like when uh, for image we use uh, matrix, this is uh, for them, uh, we can't use matrix as a data structure. So, here graph is just a data structure to manifest uh, the model. All right, and then you have the structure where you're looking at it, but of course networks can have different structures, uh, yeah. so you don't have the lattice property where it has nearest neighbors that are regular, uh, like yeah. you would have, and then it has like, it could have like 
two nearest neighbors, it could have 50. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because of the way that uh, networks are, con uh, graph networks are connected versus like a lattice where you have like a, a uniform distribution of neighbors. So yeah, that's that's actually an interesting property. Uh, like know, for example, a perfect uh, lattice can be, uh, I guess, according uh, to me, not sure. Like for example, if you have, uh, if you are modeling diamond or Buckminster Fullerene, these are very perfect kind of solids. So they might be get represented uh, in form of, you know, a perfect uh, lattice. But for an average, uh, for an average molecule, uh, we have to use uh, a data structure uh, that is much of, you know, can incorporate its instability. Right. Yeah, we, you know, we the paper that we wrote on the ANNs and BNNs, uh, we kind of yeah. talk about like uh, neural networks, and then we talk about brain networks. And one of the things about brain networks is, is that they have this graph network structure. Yeah. And so, That's it, yeah. Better <laughs> at for, uh, tolerating the fault because uh, these CNNs are very much, you know, uh, how they said, these are uh, not uh, very fuzzy in nature. They are like uh, rigid, but graph neural network can, you know, or, uh, incorporate any of the thing. It doesn't need to be kind of a perfect lattice. They can be uh, the topology that they are providing uh, is very uh, kind of decentralized and uh, kind of much more fault tolerant. Yeah, but they are more versatile in short. So, do they? What's the performance look like? I mean, are they? I'm not. I'm not kept up with the literature on that. But do they? Do they, are they comparable to like a normal convolution architecture? in terms of like, I mean, have people done that comparison or? Okay, uh, the, uh, I have not got much into that literature also, but uh, they are relatively a new term uh, because uh, CNNs are being going from like, uh, after the invention of AlexNet in 2012, uh, CNN are being developed religiously, but uh, for graph neural network, it's uh, quite a new term. And uh, it, the work started, may, most of the work started uh, maybe one or two years back. But uh, if we get into the performance for given same data, uh, a graph convolution network uh, will outshine a, a regular CNN. That's interesting, yeah. yeah. I mean, I would expect it to, but I don't, I mean, I don't know how easy or hard it is to implement. I mean, there's some things yeah. that... Uh, are claimed to do really a lot better, but they're very hard to implement. All right, these are uh, I, these are just kind of you know a data structures for representing things like a matrix can be done for an image. So uh, a graph is you can say a much more versatile data structure. So that's just the manifest uh, manifestation how we did it. So uh, if it's more versatile, it can be used for you know a variety of tasks. But yeah, a lot of work is going on, and I guess in uh, north, uh, near future, maybe in coming years, uh, there'll be, you know, there'll be the new state of the art. Yeah, yeah. Let's see. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So, uh, the, these these have I according to me, only one tenth of research is going on them. Most of the things are happening with the you know language models and CNNs. These are comparatively very much new and unexplored. Yeah, yeah. You don't talk about them much. Yeah, I think that's it. I know we don't talk too much. Well, we don't talk enough about networks in this group, but we do do network research. Uh, and we're going to be uh, ne at Networks 2021. So that'll be uh, uh, something I don't know. Like, we have an accepted talk at Networks 2021, and it's a virtual event, so if people want to uh, attend, I can send the information out. Um, and then I, I actually, uh, and I'll show you in a little bit, I put in a application for another workshop at the, or a, they don't call it a workshop, but they call it like a parallel session at the event. So, uh, you know, that'll be, yeah, so I don't know, we, we might talk more about Networks soon. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, did anyone else have anything they wanted to present? I don't know if. 
hello. Hi. How are you? All right. How are you? Good. So I also have something to say. I was like working on Seller Autumn and I thought I should update them, you know. Okay. Uh, not much, but yeah, I have something to say. All right. Yeah, so I'll share my screen. Yeah, share your screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so, as a part of uh, my uh, learning about Cerebro Automata, I am currently working on growing new Cerebro Automata in which we have differentiable model of morphogenesis. Uh, so, the idea overall here is to use Cerebro Automata along with neural networks for art recreation. I mean, we, uh, la since last few weeks, I have been working on Cerebro Automata, but now I've uh, in in but then we are using cellular automata along with the neural network for art creation, for regeneration and further things that I will tell you later. So the output of the project which I am currently working on, it's not done first of all, so yeah, it's in, the, in progress. So the output is not just simple images, but they are like virtual organisms you can say that are similar to a living body and they grow and, and respond to changes. Uh, like a, a salamander, right? If it said that if it's if we cut into two halves, it, will, it is able to regenerate itself or uh, you know, the parts which it has lost. So that regeneration process of uh, in real life, how to stimulate it in uh, virtual uh, reality, that is what we are doing here. Um, so yeah, first of all, this is the example of uh, from a neurocellular automata. So the dominance which you are seeing is of, of, of the famous, uh, the bathroom dog icon by Keith Haring. So the bottom set of the uh, cellular automata models that you can see below, which are just forming the image, the final image which is shown above, uh, is, has learned, they, all the eight models have learned to recreate the icons. So the bottom diff is not simply a set of frames, it is a continuously growing and interactive model that interacts, that starts from a single seed, like from, uh, from nothing to a dog image. That is what uh, it is. It does, and it does it, and it just saturates when it knows that it has reached the target image, and this is what it wants. But the biggest question here, the challenge which you are facing in the field is how to correctly tell a call when to build or what to build, like starting from nothing and going to a dog. I mean, it sounds weird. So how does the model look, and at when to stop? That is what are the questions. So biology has all these questions figured out quite well. We have evolution, salamander on its own know that it has, if it is cut into two halves, it has to develop two legs and not ten. Uh, otherwise, it would be weird. But how to do this and make our computers know about this virtually? And for that, we have cellular automata neural network, as the name suggested. So in terms of cellular automata, the problem lies in finding the update true. Like we know that in a cellular automata, what basically we have is a single cell and its neighbors and we have to update the cells depending upon its neighbors. So how do we know what update true to be used? And instead of finding the optimal update true in biology, what we do is here, here is that we can employ a neural algorithm that finds the rules over se several generations. Like neural, neural uh, networks, what they do is they uh, by seeing a lot of examples, they try to learn what is the best uh, approach here and therefore using them they can find out the rule like okay for a dog, this is how it should be developed, how the neighbor should go forward depending on the target. So neural network can go through several trials as some form of virtual evolution that organisms go through. For example, for so many years and billions of years of evolution, like virtual organisms are gone. Similarly, kind of, in the same way, neural network will again and again go have many epochs and will try to learn what, what the rules are and therefore we can use a neural architecture to create a targeted image from, uh, from a seed itself. So, uh, in the project which I am doing, the focus on the cellular automata model, it's, it's, it basically focuses on the cellular automata model as a roadmap for efforts uh, of identifying cell level rules, like for each cell, how each cell will develop and give rise to more complex and regenerative behavior as overall. Uh, and the, the major ha task in hand right now, which I am currently working on, is to develop an update rule, starting from a single cell and how to produce that multicellular pattern in a 2D grid where we have um, organisms that regenerate. So the, there are three, there are actually four, uh, four, four sub parts of this project. The first one, which is the basic one, is how to simply train a cellular automata to develop a target image from random weights. From a single, like for, for example, like you can see, a sim, from nothing, you have to develop the, uh, the 
or uh, image which is suitable for you. And we know the four uh, images that you are seeing, they all are from four different models, uh, cellular automata models, and you can see it is not that any rule would work. Some of them are giving very blunt results, it looks like an explosion, and the last one is like quite near, it is what you want, a flying, a flying thing. Uh, so yeah, this is what I am currently working on. Uh, the next thing that it would be is to use a dynamic system for getting the image. Not a very hard-coded one, but how to go about doing it in a dynamic way. Then the next part is what if we cut this last image into half? Would the cellular automata be able to regenerate the second part of it? That is what the uh, third, third part of the project would be. And rotating the perspective field is like if we tilt the object a bit, uh, what difference that would cause to the output. So yeah, these are the four experiments that uh, that I will be doing in the near future. And the uh, first one is something which I have half done with. The for, uh, I mean, I don't have very great results right now, but hopefully next week I'll have better results. So yeah, this project basically is a toy, uh, is, this pro pro provides a toy embryogenesis and regeneration model, which can be used for understanding and the control of regeneration. So yeah. And um, this is what I've been doing recently. Well, that's good. Thank you. Uh, so I, I see if you go back to like slide eight, maybe. Okay. Uh, so that's, so at the bottom you have this image that's being sort of generated from mm -hmm. over time. So it's just kind of blurry. Yeah, the, these are from four different uh, models. Cellular automata models because they had learned it in a different way. Oh, okay. So these are different mm -hmm. models. Yeah. These these don't like are th these aren't like a, it's not a time series. It's like different. No, models. no. Oh, okay. Individually, they are like a single one. You can see when it begins, it starts from nothing and then it develops. Okay. Uh, so these are four, from four. Like you can see now, they're starting from scratch and they're forming different different things because the update rules are different. Okay, so the update rules. This is one of the examples. I need to improve it because uh, it's not very good right now. It needs a bit of a more improvement, and I'll probably show it to you next week, a better version of this. Okay, so the update rules change over time as the as they're learned. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then you end up with refined rules, and then you end up with something that's sharper than before, maybe more detail. Right. Okay, that's good. Um, or a bunch of things in the chat. Let's see. Uh, Abacek says, I'm sorry I'm not able to present a presentation as I am not from biological background. Very difficult for me to come up with models or features which will be useful to this community and biology researchers. Uh, you can, Abacek, you can, uh, you know, present on something, you know, we can help you through the examples. That's not a problem. I mean, if you want to find something interesting, you can present on it. Uh, I mean, you know, it's yeah, there's always some application to it, so uh, so don't feel like intimidated by that. Uh, my Knox is interesting presentation. Graph convolution seem interesting. That was for Krishna. Susan says I have a paper somewhere that says that molecules tend to accumulate on curves, become more concentrated. It's a concentration curves. So uh, if you could share that, that would be good. Uh, Debo, I don't know which. Uh, presenter, which libraries did you use? Um, I'm not sure. Well, I mean, that could apply to both of you. <laughs> yeah, actually, I'm uh, just using working on TensorFlow right now, so um, it is just opening your CNN. I, I, I actually have a detailed presentation once the work is completed next week, probably. Um, then I guess uh, you have all the answers to your questions. Okay, so basically it's uh, uh, like uh, first we have an uh, embryo like a small cell and after that it will grow develop and um, what you say? Yeah, uh, exactly. It, it is, that is actually trying to replicate what happens in real life. We start from a single cell and then we multiply, multiply, multiply and form, uh, you know, a multicellular organism, different kind of. The so same thing is happening here. What we have is, we have some uh, set of rules. And using the set of rules, we give them to a CNN, and the CNN tries to learn how we are, uh, you know, modeling this. And uh, after learning all the update rules, we give it a random uh, noise image, and that image is converted into what we see right now, different objects. 
So, yeah. So, Dick had a uh, comment here. Uh, see my two two recent Janus faced papers. So this is what I, I think we talked about the uh, one of them last week in the meeting. Uh, the Janus face logic, um, and he says feedback seems to be mostly local, maybe sometimes global and animal morphogenesis. So you know feedback. There's feedback between the cells. Uh, that the local feedback dominates, but sometimes it can be like farther out than local. So um, I mean, this is something that you know it'd be interesting to see if the neural networks discover that sort of pattern or how mm -hmm. you know how we can sort of assess it. Uh, Debo says, "Are you starting with a random seed?" Yeah. Okay. And Yash says, "Very interesting." Thank you. So that's it. Good. Thank you for the comments. Um, thank you for to Krishna and Shruti for presenting. Um, oh, we have one more comment in the chat here. Uh, Vrudic seems to be a cool field. Okay. It is. It is. Yeah. Actually, it's very interesting. Yeah. Hopefully we'll have uh, more results next week. It will seem more interesting and more people can come in and join. It's like very fun. Yeah. Oh, Dick says uh, someone needs to rope in Michael Levin's observation of bioelectric fields and morphogenesis. Yeah, we, well, we talked about this last week too, I think. Uh, uh, Michael Levin, who I think we've talked about a number of times in the group, he's done a lot of work on bioelectric effects. And of course, we talked about the flatworm last week so um, yeah so that's good um, so okay uh, so, I think you have your the cover on your desk up on the camera I can't see you yeah I don't know what happened there there we go <laughs> yeah oh you're muted too <laughs> <laughs> There we go. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Look, has anyone uh, in your reading on cellular automata, has anyone ever tried to include electrical phenomena? Uh, I don't know what that is and if anyone has done that. I'm not very good in biology actually, so. Uh, Okay, bioelectricity goes back over a century. It was observed in uh, uh, fish eggs and things like that around 1900. Okay. There's a whole book on uh, in the 1940s on bioelectricity. Electricity. Uh, Lionel Jaffe discovered many phenomena uh, having to do with bioelectricity, and the current protagonist of this stuff is Michael Levin. And okay. it's never been integrated with anything else in morphogenesis that I know of. Okay, that's cool. So you, you guys who have studied some electrical engineering, maybe you should learn something about this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, sorry, you can give it a look at definitely. Okay. The, uh, you know, for instance, Lionel Jaffe found that when the uh, brain is starting to form, it's called a neural plate, and mm -hmm. it had, he found what he called large electric currents coming out of, coming out of the neural plate and going back in. Uh, in chick embryos, and oh. uh, you know that's never been explained or incorporated into morphogenesis models, as far as I know. Oh. Okay. So oh, and uh, you know Michael Levin is discovering all sorts of interesting phenomena, but uh, I've tried. I can't get him to try to incorporate it into uh, anybody else's model. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. Yeah, I can, you can look into that stuff too. Okay, so uh, you now maybe maybe we should start putting together some papers on electrical phenomena and mm -hmm. see if they can be brought in under the you know into cellular tolerance and stuff like that. Yeah, that sounds interesting. We definitely can work in that direction. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's could be sort of multimodal simulations. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because uh, yeah. you know, electric phenomena—they're invisible, and so they're generally ignored. <laughs> when the currents are so small. Uh, yeah. We have some other comments. Uh, Debo said eel, which me- well, that's that's an electro sensation, and I mean, it's yeah. I guess it's a similar thing, but it, it's a different scale. Um, and actually, eels have, uh, but there are a lot of fishes actually that have electro sensation that at the organismal level. Uh, we're talking yes, about at the a, cell. Yeah, but those are those are adult fish and uh, you know adult electric eels. So what's going on during development? <laughs> <laughs> so there's cell so, cell communication. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, Susan says. She's- Calcium channels and cells are triggered by mechanical movements. So that is an observation. Uh, Debo says some sharks have electric sense. Can they accept, sense electric changes in their surroundings? You mean sharks? I think that's the whole reason for electrosensation is that they build this field up around the sense organ and then they're able to receive like you know discontinuities in the field so they create this electrical field and there's this sensation of like discontinuities you might have like prey going into the field or you might have some other organism come into the field and they can navigate that way so uh yeah it's 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 largely for sensation for detecting things Uh, a lot of fishes that live in uh you know, brackish waters or very dark waters in, say, like the Amazon, uh, they have electrosensation because they can't really see anything. So they have to have a way to see, th- you know, to sense their environment. Um, and then Susan says there are calcium waves in cells and embryos. Yeah. I mean, that's that's why we want to study uh, electrical you know, uh, cell-cell communication. Uh um, uh, Bradley, we have a whole issue of biosystems on uh, on waves in cells and embryos. It's coming coming yeah. up. There's, I think there might be some papers already published. There. Yeah, yeah, that's the waves issue. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, is that closed now, or is it? Uh... I think it closes in a couple of weeks. Okay, that's good. So we'll have to look at it when it. When it's done. But there might, uh, you know, the special issues published piecemeal. You know, there might be some papers wrong. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we'll have to see what the. I I looked over. I looked it over a little bit. There were a couple uh, uh, articles that looked really interesting. So we'll have to go over it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a uh, uh, Lionel Jaffe, for instance, studied fucus eggs. Fucus is a uh, a seaweed that has uh, very thin, flat leaves, and the eggs develop in the leaves. Uh, and these eggs uh, actually seem to have currents that go in and out uh, through holes and establish polarity to the uh, to the egg. And then one end becomes what's called a holdfast, which is where the new algae attaches to a rock or something. Okay. okay. So, so there, you know, there is some evidence of a direct relationship between electrical currents and morphogenesis, uh, but uh, it hasn't been brought into multicellular organisms uh, except for uh, what what Michael Levin is doing now. Right. But uh, you know, he seems to be mostly on the discovery phase, not integrating with our, with the rest of the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's very yeah, it's very interesting work though. It's uh, but it, yeah, it's something that I mean, of course we could model it, you know, just as well. I mean, you know, yeah. it's going to be limited by our knowledge, but we can also play with the parameters yeah. and figure out. It might be fun, for example, to take a cellular automata, model each cell as having a current going in and out of it, which can influence other cells. So uh, mm-hmm. the, the current. The advantage of a current is it's kind of a global phenomenon. It fades off with distance, but it's global in that it covers uh, a large territory. And 
Uh, I don't know, just play around with the idea, see what one gets with it. You can make silly autonomy with these with electrical rules. Definitely, yeah, we can see that. Okay. I mean, if each one is sort of a battery which generates a current, and then mm -hmm. it influences the cell, uh, or it influences other cells, you can mm -hmm. see the possibility of maybe getting something out of this. I'm not sure what. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's. Uh, yeah, I think everyone else in the chat is basically agreeing. It sounds interesting. And here's diffusion yeah. of electrical current. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, I look forward to seeing more on this. Uh, it looks really interesting. And yeah, hey, really, maybe invite Michael Levin to give us a lecture to the whole group. All right. <laughs> I'll see. I know he's very busy, so I don't know. I know he's always very busy. <laughs> He, like I said, he's fine with his stuff. He's having great fun. Yeah. <laughs> I'll see. I'll see <laughs> the worst he can say is no. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for that. Um, I guess I want to talk about submissions next. We have some a little bit of news on that. And then I wanted to talk about the digital basal area paper that were sort of, uh, you know, we promised to do this and it's the time is ticking down on this, so we need to figure out what to do. So, um, oh, let me share my screen actually. Um, so the submission sheet here, uh, this is of course our master sheet and we have, the, a couple of deadlines coming up. Uh, Evolution 2021, again, if you want to submit to that, the deadline is April 30th. Uh, Krishna had an idea, kill the winners, if that's still uh, go, you know, uh, submit it or else, you know, we can find another venue. And then there's this other paper that might be submitted as well on my end. So the deadline for that is April 30. And anyone can submit something if you think it's a good fit. Um, uh, the Diva Learn paper that's not been moved on very much, that's something we'll move on maybe later. There's so many different deadlines, it's hard to keep up. Uh, <laughs> um, then there's this growth form and the theory of deep learning uh, abstract. And I actually submitted this to Net Neuro Satellite, which is, so the NetSci conference, or I guess the Networks 2021, they changed the name recently. Um, that that main conference, we have a, uh, uh, an abstract already accepted to that, this Embryo Networks and Connectomics abstract. And so um, that's in the main session. And they also had a call for uh, network neuroscience. So I, I submitted this to that uh, satellite. And I'm not sure if it'll get accepted I don't know if it's even a good fit necessarily, but I mean, I just put it in to see if, if we'll, we can get in. And, uh, you know, I don't know. There might be other satellites coming up for that, that uh, conference. It's a pretty good conference. It's, it's one of the best network conferences or the sort of premier network conference. And, um, you know, even if you just attend, it's, it, I think it's a fairly reasonable registration rate they've got a lot of good stuff on networks. So if that's something you're interested in, uh, I don't know if they're going to have any uh, uh, graph convolution papers, but uh, that's, you know, they, it, it looks like that might end up being, come uh, that might end up getting integrated into that field. Who knows? Um, but I think that's something that uh, to keep an eye on. Uh, so, so that we have that satellite paper, and then the main conference paper here, or it's not a paper, it's an abstract, but. Uh, the next thing is this Baccalaurea non neuronal cognition. So this is for this volume on the mathematics of diatoms. And this is, uh, it says due April 30th, but I actually got an extension on this for several weeks. Uh, I negotiated that. So that's something that's coming up, but it's there's an extension on it. Uh, this is something needs to be worked on. Uh, it's not in the greatest of shape, and I'll show you in a minute what I mean. 
Um, we're still waiting on the open room poster on a decision on that. Uh, these things are done in green, so all these things are done. We still have the boring billion work, uh, this idea of a Kindle book of a lot of the content from Diva Worm ML. And then we have open uh, conferences. Well, we have the ANN, BNN's abstract, which, or actually it's a paper now. So I think extended abstract was an old thing. Uh, that we're, We'll probably hear about that by the end of the month. I'm not really sure what the, their timeline is on that, but uh, that's for A-Life 2021. Uh, it's another conference. So then we have a couple other things that, that are coming up deadline-wise. Um, there's NeurIPS, Neur which there's an abstract deadline of May 19th and a full paper deadline of May 26th. And there are a lot of satellites to NeurIPS as well. So if you want to if you have an idea, like in machine learning or deep learning, that might be something you can submit to. Um, the Mathematics of Diva Worm, that's something, Wormbook, uh, potentially from Wormbook, but we're still working on that. Uh, there's a Living Machines Conference, which I think is the 2021 version has come out now, and I think the deadline for submitting papers is May 30th on that. So this is a, a conference where, you know, if you're interested in things like, you know, uh, I guess the, there, you know, there's an interest in robotics at the conference, but there's also an interest in other types of computational models. So that might be something we might do something for. Uh, the Society for Developmental Biology, that deadline is passed. They, uh, that's more biological stuff. So I don't think that's something we're going to make so we'll put that in gray so if you have any other things you want to add to this feel free to send me things i can put them on the list or put them on uh if you're if you want to put them on yourself you can um jesse sometimes up, it updates this uh sheet as well with opportunities so um okay. yeah really uh, uh two two things uh, yeah. uh the uh the stuff on testing Donald Williamson's ideas on symbiosis uh, uh, could be part of the boring billion. We'll see what, what comes out of it. Right. And, uh, if there's anyone who has had some training in uh, blasting, uh, comparing DNAs and whatnot, uh, you might want to get, interest, get into this. The, the, what Williamson proposed, but it's never been properly tested, is that some weird organisms like tunicates and whatnot are actually uh, fertilization of some animal by an entirely different sperm and you end up with a compound animal and uh, this should show up in the DNA in some fashion uh, we're trying to figure out how to do that okay so if you've got background in uh, uh, analysis of DNA sequences and whatnot uh, you might want to join us on that Okay, so, uh, you know, uh, test, of, test of Donald Williamson symbiosis or something like that for a title. <laughs> I can put that in here. Right, and then we'll just put like this. Yeah, and then yeah, we the can... reason it might fit in the boring billion because one of the things we hope to get out of this is when these symbioses occur, and uh, it's just a hunch that most of them might have occurred during the boring Right. Uh, number 15. Uh, yeah. All right, that sounds good. Okay, the other thing is I'm, I'm working right now on a uh, computer simulation uh, of uh, a lattice model at the molecular level for how biotops move. You know, the, the idea is to uh, try to explain at a molecular level why diatoms don't move smoothly and move in tiny little very fast jerks. And uh, some, mostly forward, sometimes backwards. Uh, and uh, we've been ha having some discussions now with Thomas uh, Harbich uh, where he thinks the diatoms can actually sense their environment 
uh, through the through the race. So uh, I don't. I try to figure out how to possibly incorporate that in the model. I'm not sure. Okay. So uh, you could put down a molecular level simulation of jerky motion of diatoms. <laughs> yeah. Something like that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't mean they're jerks. Yeah, jerks. Yeah, jerk. Yeah, there's no good way to put that, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I know, like, yeah, the, uh, yeah, they actually, well, yeah, they actually, like, in moments of position, like, you know, it's like the, there's acceleration and, and, uh, then there's like jerk, and then there's snap, crackle, and pop, which are higher <laughs> movement dynamics. <laughs> yeah, they move so fast. We we uh, we got a paper uh, uh, in uh, uh, the diatom motility book, which is in press right now. Uh, around 1979, uh, uh, Linda Edgar observed that the motion had very high accelerations between movie frames. She was doing 10 frames per second. So we tried to do it with a much faster camera at 890 frames per second, and we got exactly the same result. Huge accelerations in between frames. And I'll try to explain that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. And we're, right now, the 890 frames per second were about at the limits of the camera and definitely at the limits of the microscope because we had to develop all sorts of sub-pixel algorithms to to measure the motion. So, so, because the motion had enormous accelerations between one frame and the next and between one pixel and the next. So we had to get sub-pixel resolution to uh, get values for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's... Yeah, so that, that actually brings me to the um, stuff that we're trying to do on uh, Basel area. So I, I, I was in yeah. in the loop on the emails between you and Thomas, so I was reading those. I responded to Thomas. I don't know if I got you on that, CC'd you, but I basically, you know, I, I expressed, you know, uh, interest or admiration for his uh, Kuramoto oscillator model. So he's yeah. he's doing this Kuramoto oscillator model to describe movement, and so there there are a number of different uh, ways you can look at this. Um, the, the what we have in in this uh, the thing I'm trying to work on here for the Basel area non neuronal cognition, we have actually two kind of two papers that uh, are kind of running in parallel here, and the idea would be to integrate these. So one of them is based on the sort of psychophysical world model of uh, motility, and this has uh, this has a lot of. If you want to look at this, uh, it's on GitHub. So I I put it here as sort of an open papers, but I think I'm gonna semi close this up a little bit, and I want to work on it a little bit more. But if you want to take a look at it, there is the link. Um, you know, there's some sort of organization to it. It's not very, uh, you know, it's it's still in pretty, uh, you know, rough shape. So there's that. And then there's also this idea of uh, collective pattern generators. So these are like, you know, in, uh, in um, chordates, you have these, or even in invertebrates, you have these central pattern generators that generate uh, oscillations. But these are neurons. And so in this case, what we're arguing is that there's this collective pattern generator, which is generated by collectives of cells that do kind of the same thing. And so uh, this is something that is maybe running parallel to this psychophysical model. And this will have, this is, there's actually some, uh, a data set in uh, using stick insects as a, a model. And they're looking at synergistic central pattern generators uh, so you can, you know, that's that's one source of data you can use as a comparison. Um, and then these are some modeling things that 
were done a while back on looking at just modeling the sinusoids at different phases. So the cells are moving, but they're moving at different phases to one another. So there's this, you know, there are these different uh, signals that are generated. So all this basically is uh, in very rough shape right now, and it needs to be integrated and then expanded upon. And so I, I'm just putting these links in here to describe it or so that people can look at it and maybe give some feedback. Uh, I'm going to be working on this in the next couple weeks, and then I'll come back to the group with a more polished sort of rough draft. And then hopefully people can maybe read through these and give some a little bit of, you know, feedback about maybe things that we should add or, you know, if, if there are things. I'm not really relying on data for this paper. I originally planned to have a data analysis, but I don't think we're in a position to do that. Um, you know, there are different ways you could approach this. I'm not really sure, uh, you know, if there's like, we don't, I mean, we don't really even have a simulation that we can build upon, but uh, I think just the, a discussion of it or maybe, you know, I, I would like to hear from people. Maybe there's a way to sort of uh, crack this nut in a very, you know, uh, something that won't take like a year to develop. But I, I'm just, for right now, I'm just kind of thinking about like writing this up sort of based on what we have here, but just kind of expanding on this and integrating these two documents. And then uh, that should be probably enough. And then we'll see where we are with that. Um, other than that, I mean, it's just kind of, uh, you know, well, we'll see. <laughs> okay, thanks, Oswald. Well, we'll read through them thoroughly once. And again, we have a lot of stuff that's up and coming in the group. A lot of people are doing analyses and things like that. Um, and I talked to Thomas about his data. So Thomas is the person who generated a lot of the data that's in the uh, in the folders. So a lot of maybe some of you have seen this data that you've maybe worked with it a little bit. Uh, but that's going to take a while to get that, that ramped up where we have a good analysis pipeline, something that we can actually publish. Um, so yeah, that's that's where that stands. Right. Does anyone uh, have experience with uh, fast motor control? Uh, for instance, uh, Tom, Thomas Harvich could use, he's got standard microscopes. He could use a system uh, where he can do very fast through focus imaging of uh, moving diatoms so he can get them 3D. Uh, anybody got any experience with that kind of thing? I mean, the typical motion is about 10 microns per second. So if you want to get them in 3D, especially the best Larry colonies, you've got to be fast. You've got to vibrate your focus fast. Let's see. See lenses. Okay. Could you, Susan, do you know a commercial source for them? Maybe you could send that to uh, Thomas. I found a piezo electric vibrator, but uh, uh, it didn't call itself a Z-Lens. Okay, well, I uh, wrote a brief um, sentence about them in my paper, in the Waves paper. Oh, okay, um, good. It, uh, according to the uh, author who developed it, they're easy to make. Oh. That could mean they're easy for me to make, but <laughs> Well, Thomas is an engineer, so <laughs> maybe he could do it. Yeah, they're uh, a, basically a lens that is at uh, different focal points, and okay. it, and so where um, wherever you aim the lens, you get uh, different depths reading out, then, reading out from the center. You can synchronize that with a camera, so you can get images of the different depths. Yeah, apparently it, it focuses on the different depths, so you only have to take one okay. snap to get the different depths. Oh, oh, okay, so you could do it rapidly in, in stop motion of the best <laughs> Yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah, that would be useful, because one of the problems is pictures have uh, some cells in focus, some and many out of focus, and because uh, there are slightly different depths, which makes uh, uh, cell segmentation very difficult. So if we, if we get the sharp images, 
uh, then uh, it would be much easier to do it and track them, track the cells. Okay, I'll look up that paper as well. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and I think we had a comment, I don't remember who it was in their proposal who talked about using Z, uh, Z, uh, uh, like the, the uh, depth of the, you know, for the, uh, going through different slices of the embryo, so the Z-axis information. Uh, and so I don't know, I don't know who that was, but. It was me. It was me. Okay, me. Yeah. Uh, I have a few images. I got an image data set in Z-axis too for uh, C. elegans embryo, uh, and I picked data set uh, two has plus and minus provided uh, slice-wise imaging. Uh, up to 31 slices which I have used to generate uh, extract uh, centroids from 3D images. The outputs are pretty good now but I have to do some work upon because exact 2D algorithm doesn't work there. We have to think about Z axis also. Right. So I am working upon it uh, right now so I can filter out the correct indexes of like, correct centroids. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, see that, that, that data is probably from a, a dead embryo. The problem with bacillary is you have to get that data in under a tenth of a second. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's very challenging. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. So let me, uh, I'm going to go back and share my screen and I want to make a couple announcements and then I'm going to get into some of the papers and then we'll wrap up for today. So uh, a couple announcements here. Um, the first is that the NeuroMatch Academy is open for applications. So the NeuroMatch Academy is something that happens in the summer. Happened la the inaugural one happened last year. It was on computational neuroscience. So if you're interested in learning more about neuroscience, this is a good place to go. It's uh, about a two or three week uh, uh, intense period during July. So if you uh, go to this, so this, this repository has the course content. Um, so you can look over what they're going to cover. Everything is open to the public, so people can reuse this in different ways. Um, but they make it. But but the actual, if you apply for the academy, you get the benefit of interacting with people and doing a project and all this. So you can do the. Um, you can apply to be either a student or a TA out or a mentor. I'm going to apply to be a mentor again this year for the academy. Um, and this is the, so last year they just did the one on computational neuroscience. This year they're actually doing a second uh, summer school in August on deep learning. And so um, this is, they're there they're because they, they found that there was a lot of demand for it last year. So they're going to do a lot of, uh, they're going to do another one on deep learning in August. And so I think that um, the person who's running this has debugged this on their course at uh, UPenn, which is the University of Pennsylvania, and they're doing a course on this now, and they're kind of working out the details. So this is a new course, but it's been sort of worked through and debugged. Um, but if you're interested, and I know a lot of you in this group are interested in deep learning and doing a lot of deep learning research. So if you want to apply to be a TA for this, I would recommend uh, checking this out. There's a, I can't remember if I have the link in the um, I can get you the link. Um, I don't know if they have a link in this repository, but um, anyways, we'll, we'll, if you're interested, contact me and I can send you the link. Uh, can the you, other... Um, can I add, add something? Yeah, go ahead. Hey, um, I, would, I, I really uh, encourage people who don't know about Neuromath to check it out. I'm, I, did, I did it last year. I was in the intensive track uh, some people here may have done that too, but I did it last year. Um, there's a big need for TA, so if you are experienced with it, both in the computational neuroscience course and the uh, the deep learning course, will need TA. So please consider that if you have skills or know somebody that does. Um, there are volunteer forms for that, uh, but. Also, know like if you are a TA, you will get paid. They work very hard to make sure they get funded properly. Paid TAs. 
but you can also volunteer in a bunch of different ways from editing the material to outreach to communications to funding. There are many ways really you can volunteer as well. I'm, I'm trying to volunteer again this year a little bit. Uh, I did it last year, but I'm working on some of the outreach and some of the editing uh, this year. So there's a lot of different ways you can contribute, and um, there will be two courses, and so kind of like July and August, and it will be a thing to do, and, and I know I'm going to try to be involved as much as I can. I have a lot of other projects going on in the summer and data already stuff this summer, but this is kind of one of the one of the things I'm most looking forward to because it's such a great community. It's such a positive atmosphere, and you can you can do. I don't quite know what they're going to do for the deep learning course. Uh, I do know it will be very good. Comrades kind of spearheading it, but but uh, there will be a lot of opportunity to make. A, a group project again in the, the computational neuroscience course as well. And I think that would be a really cool way to either maybe flesh out some things in this group or really stuff you're interested in, or find other people totally different to work with and do stuff there. Uh, like I really, I really think it's a great thing to do. And if you're really strapped for time, and you can't invest in like the intensive nature of, of the course. And I'm pretty sure they're offering a and I don't know if you've heard anything about this Friday, but last year they offered kind of a, a general, anybody can stop by and look at this and look at the lectures course, like, like a less intensive track and a more intensive track. And I think they're doing that again this year. Have you heard that? I, I'm not familiar with what, if they've changed. The last year that they did do the uh, observer track. Yeah, so, I mean, they'll probably do that again this year, I imagine, just because yeah, it's flexible. Yeah. They're really focused on outreach and getting, getting people access to the material and, and trying to get it very inclusive and, and very progressive in what they're doing. So uh, if you're interested in like educational processes and, and sort of what, you know, the future of some learning uh, stuff and, and conferences and technology and, and how it's put together, I really encourage checking it out. Um, and um, I'm, you know, I, I've had a great experience there, so that's why I'm, I'm trying to wrap it as much as I can. But um, definitely reach out to, to Bradley or to me if you have any questions and um, hope to see you there. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's my that. yeah. Uh, the other thing I'd like to point out is that we have, uh, this is the first day of the uh, INCF uh, assembly. And so this is a meeting of people across INCF. And so as you know, we're involved in INCF quite a bit. And this is uh, the talk, the Devo Learn talk. This is now up on our YouTube channel. So if you're interested in um, uh, seeing this, go to the YouTube channel. We already have 12 views, it looks like. Um, so you can go there and check it out. And we have, um, it's, you know, it's about 15 minutes. Yeah, 13 minutes. Um, and it basically goes over the DevoLearn platform and some of the things that we've done. And I think they're going to be pretty interested. Uh, it's going to be, you know, it's it's online, so the way it works is if you're registered, you can go in and, and uh, chat about it um, in an online portal. And if it, this were a physical conference, they'd have, like, booths, and you'd do your demo in a booth. But this is sort of the same thing, but it's just virtual. So hopefully we'll get some feedback on that. Um, so the final thing I wanted to talk about today are the papers. So we have uh, a couple papers. I don't want to get into too many. Uh, I found a nice, yesterday I found a nice image of a zebrafish here. Uh, this is a reconstruction of a zebrafish larval brain using 2,000 individually labeled neurons. So this is uh, an image. Oh, I can't do this directly, but I have the, uh, I had the uh, file in here. I wanted to show the animation, but it won't let me play it. So. This is a, a animation where they've modeled all these neurons and some connections, and then they're rotating it in space. So uh, that's kind of an interesting thing. Um, I was going to point out to this book. This is a book that I've been working with to, to kind of give. Uh, this is an older book on aneural organisms and neurobiology. It's kind of interesting in light of the things that we're doing with Basilaria. It, it kind of goes through, it's an older book, but it kind of goes through a lot of different model systems. And so this is something, oh, this isn't the right one though. Um, 
this is the con yeah the table of contents so kind of talks about like aneural systems and protozoans and sort of the uh, approach to neurobiology in uh, microorganisms, cybernetics and the behavior of microorganisms, uh, membrane potential and behavior. So this is like, you know, they're not, uh, they're actually the sort of electrical potential that we've been talking about, not really uh, bona fide neurons with action potentials, but nevertheless, they have membrane potentials and that plays a role in this type of behavior. Uh, contractility of muscle cells and non-muscular contractile cells. So there's a lot of information in this book, and I've been exploring it, uh, trying to get insights. So, you know, maybe once I get the paper in better shape, we can talk about some of these points. Um, if you're interested in this book, I can I can actually put it on the, um, on the Slack to see if, you know, maybe that's something that people want to learn about. Um, and I actually, I wanted to talk a little bit, go back to this topic of development of early life and uh, talk about some of the newer papers. So this is actually kind of combining the boring billion with um, embryogenesis and uh, developmental biology. So um, this is the first paper I'm going to talk about is this current biology paper on a possible billion-year-old holozoan with differentiated multicellularity. So what this is, is it's, uh, this is an in brief. Strother et al. describes life cycle morphogenesis in a new billion-year-old microfossil, which may provide clues to the evolutionary roots of embryonic development in animals. So uh, uh, several weeks ago, we talked about the Doshanto embryo, which is this embryo they found in China from a plant. And so they, they show this, this embryo, they call it sort of one of the first embryos, and they show like in the fossil record this embryo, and it's kind of amazing that you can get that kind of preservation, but you can in this assemblage that they have. So this is another example. This is in a, a billion-year-old protist. So protists branched off from plants and animals at about the same time. It was around that billion-year mark. Uh, we talked, we had that I don't know if you remember the figure that I showed where we had the boring billion and then uh, you had an oxygenation event at the beginning and at the end. And at the end of the boring billion with the oxy second oxygenation event, you get this diversification of like plants, animals, protists, all at about the same time. And so this is one of these organisms. So this is a, micro a multicellular microfossil, Bicellum brassieri. So they, it, it uh, exhibits two distinct cell types. Um, this uh, 3D preservation and phosphate, so this preserved different life cycle stages. Differential adhesion may have contributed to cell segregation during morphogenesis. Uh, if you see this, this is the naked stage, what they call the naked stage. Then there's this process of differentiation and cell elongation, which leads to this stage here. And then you see differential adhesion and cell migration, which gives you the cyst, which is differentiated around the edge. And then it also has this naked stage in the center. So this actually looks like uh, blastocyst in, animal, um, in animals. You know, if you look at a human embryo or a mouse embryo, you see that kind of pattern where there's an outer edge and then an inner cell mass. So, it, But you notice that these cells from the naked stage they're differentiating in the, in the middle of the mass and then they're migrating out to the edge and they're adhering to and to form this ring so that's basically what they're observing um so they call it differentiated multicellularity so um, again this is another one of these papers it's very paleontological so there's a lot of uh jargon in it but um so they but let me take it from here. The mature form of bicellum consists of a solid spherical ball of tightly packed cells, a stereoblast, uh, enclosed in a monolayer of elongated sausage-shaped cells. However, two populations of naked stereoblasts show mixed cell shapes, which we can infer to indicate incipient development of elongated cells that were migrating to the periphery of the cell mass. So you saw that migration pattern in the figure. These simple morphogenetic movements can be explained by differential cell-cell adhesion. 
So, in fact, the basic morphology of bicellum is a topologically similar experience to that of experimentally produced cell masses that were shown to spontaneously segregate into two distinct domains based on differential cadherin based cell adhesion. So, they know that their models in cell biology, uh, modern models, which exhibit this type of behavior. Um, so, they're kind of drawing a parallel there. Uh, whether that's actually what happened is not really clear, but that's what they're basing this on. Uh, the lack of the rigid cell walls in the stereoblast renders an algal affinity for bicellum unlikely. That means, I guess, that they're not... Uh, yeah, its overall morphology is more consistent with the holozoan origin. So it doesn't uh, or originate from algae, it originates this holo has this holozoan origin. Unicellular holozoans are known today to form multicellular stages within complex life cycles. So they're basing this again on an analogy with living uh, organisms and what they're doing. And they're finding a common ancestry there. Uh, so the occurrence of such simple levels of transient multicellularity seen here is consistent with a holozoan affinity. Um, so they don't, they can't make a precise phylogenetic uh, prediction or placement in the tree of life, but they're just pointing to these fossils as being, and this is where they found it in this area here. Um, just so you know, it's real paleontology. And then they show pictures of the Bicellum brassieri in its mature form, it has this ring. So the entire mature phenotype is this ring and inner cell mass. So that's basically what you have as the mature form. And it's developing from like an undifferentiated set of cells into this mature form. So they show examples here of uh, how this, you know, they show a lot of microscopy here and then they have some resources. So that's that paper. Uh, the second one is this development, development, developmental capacity of the, and the early evolution of animals by Douglas Irwin. And this was something I think that was accepted recently. Um, so this is, uh, so here I employ a recently introduced conceptual framework for novelty and individuation that distinguishes between potentiation, novelty, innovation, and adaptive adjustments to the Eddicarian Cambrian radiation. So this is something that, you know, this is something again from early evolution so the early evolution of animals involved the introduction of genomic, developmental, morphological, and behavioral novelties. And this is what they call the individuation of new characters. And so this led to the construction of new ecological networks. So you had these organisms that were undifferentiated. And then they started dif finding these different uh, sort of niches, or they found niches, but they did so by diversifying their phenotypes. So, you know, the cells would diversify functionally in some way, and then they do something different from their neighbor, and they could form these ecosystems, which would then uh, allow, you know, uh, you know, it allows ecological sort of differentiation. You get a lot of, uh, you know, you get predation, you get other types of ecological relationships. And so he's kind of linking uh, developmental differentiation with this, ecological differentiation. And so uh, the origin and early history of animals included changes in cellular gene regulation and development during an interval of environmental conditions, including low and highly variable oxygen levels, low nutrient levels, and low productivity. So there was there were a lot of these ecological challenges, many more so than, say, the history of life since the end of this period, or, you know, since maybe in the last billion years, where you had really big fluctuations in oxygen and in productivity. And so a lot of the organisms that were alive, then, you know, they had to, uh, you know, evolve according to those challenges. They had to meet these challenges. And so this is where you sort of get this emergence of, um, you know, not only of, of complex life, but of ecological niches. And so, um, the feedbacks and interactions between these three factors render testing of alternate scenarios challenging, and consequently many discussions of this radiation in the Eddicarian Cambrian is focused on a single factor. So uh, evolutionary developmental biologists have largely, largely ignored environmental contexts 
While geochemists and paleontologists often view environmental changes, particularly increased levels of oxygen, as generating an evolutionary opportunity to which animals responded, but they don't talk about the developmental aspect of that as much. So this is the fr this is a framework that sort of unifies these two things, and so it kind of goes through a lot of the different details of this, um, talking about developmental capacity of the metazoan, which is the, the sort of the common ancestral animal. Um, and so the origin and early diversification of metazoans required the generation of new mechanisms to regulate multicellular interactions. And this include adhesion molecules, basement membranes, and transcription factors. So you get all these things that have to emerge in order to get these early metazoans. And so He's kind of using this framework to explain a lot of this. And uh, this leads to different cell types, of course, which then lead to these different niches in the environment. So um, I think this is a, a pretty long paper. I don't know. Uh, again, this, but this gets to this, this larger problem, this larger issue of early life and development. And if you are interested in that, um, I would, we, we should talk more about this. I'm just continuing on this this uh, theme to see where we go, or if we can, you know, maybe incorporate this in some of our work as well. So I'll go back to the chat here. Um, Susan says, there is a YouTube about organism co organisms cognition without a brain. You could, yeah, is it a video or a channel? You could send a link along if you want. Um, Ujwal says, sorry, I have to leave now. Have a nice week, everyone. Thank you, Ujwal, for attending. Um, Susan says that it's a, it's a science presentation and one in a YouTube video just needs the fracking pattern. Jesse says links to papers and I'll put the link in the chat here. Let me get the meeting link here. If you need permissions, let me know. Okay. So that's the link to the papers. Um, this paper sounds super interesting to me. Yeah, this is definitely something that, um, it's not something I think people, a lot of people have talked about um, too much. I mean, there are papers on it, but it's not, you know, it's a highly, maybe an abstract or a sort of an a, obscure area. So um, I am interested in this paper as well. Okay, so it's in the folder there. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so that's, I think that's it for that. So uh, if you've stuck it out this long, thanks for attending. I mean, thanks to everyone for attending, but you get a special uh, treat here. <laughs> and I don't have anything actually for a treat. So, but thank you for uh, for being at the meeting here this week. Uh, if you have anything, uh, anything, you know, any, any papers you want me to review, you can send them along in an email or on Slack. And if you want to do anything or, you know, if you have any observations over the course of the week or have any questions, you can communicate those via Slack or email as well. I'll send you an email with the, um, try to find that YouTube. Okay. Uh, that, and also the Z, um, or Z microscope uh, paper. Okay. That sounds good. All right. Uh, yeah, I, I did some things with Slack. I don't know if out there, but there's a few questions about uh, some things that came up today in the meeting, and also uh, a follow up along the paper, too. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> that sounds good. All right. Thanks for attending. Have a good week. Bye. 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 Bye.